So, so while we're going, I'd just like to re rebut something uh, while Mark's sitting down. Um, any organizational process, any organization requires a measure of process. It will also require some rules. It will certainly require principles. So it, it, never or almost never in a social setting will you have a do anything you want, even if you're accountable for it, versus a rule-bound structure. So it's, it's important, um, uh, to stated in a different way, what I feel is missing in modern systems is the autonomy needed to make things work. It's not nothing. <laughs> it's not not having a process. And, and there's been some suggestion that, well, if you give somebody, quote, discretion or whatever, that, that, that they could do anything. Uh, that's not what we're arguing for. We're arguing for this sort of hands-on thing. Hayek talked about it in his writings, that basically nothing works unless a human makes it work. The circumstances of time and place, to use Hayek's term, always has to be taken into account. It doesn't mean anybody can do anything. It doesn't mean in complex organizations there aren't processes. But there's also a hierarchy of authority. So Professor Walzrin talked about the need to have processes. The processes are important. But even more important is, is a hierarchy of authority to break through the logjam when the NIMBYs say, so the, the significance of, of Nicole's story about Jeanette Tzadik Khan and the, and the in making Times Square into a pedestrian mall was that someone actually had the authority to make a choice. And so it's not that she was ignoring all the stakeholders. It's just that you can't re consensus is a corrupt concept because it's always end up being gamed by somebody who wants something for themselves. If you aspire to consensus, you arrive at paralysis or, the, or being bullied. So you have to have an authority structure that actually allows public choices to be made. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's always sort of moderated autonomy, if you will, in, in any democratic system. And so I think it's really important to say that when we're moving from here to there, it's not a revolution in the, in the sense of getting rid of the Constitution or such. It's more like a revolution in the sense of the progressive era where we abandon the idea that people can do anything they want, including abuse child labor in factories, and we accepted the idea of state oversight of safety conditions and the like. And here, we just have to abandon the idea that everything is going to be a mindless rule and process and accept the fact that there's a measure of human autonomy required to make things work. And uh, Jeremy Waldron has written very uh, articulately about human dignity, that have somebody you can look in the eye and can respond if you're a citizen to your problem. You don't, you don't have a right to get your way, but you do need the right, if you will, for somebody to respond to you. Um, could I ask a question? Uh, I mean, so, you know, I think that, you know, I, 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 I should start by saying that your books have totally revolutionized the way that I think about a lot of these things. And I trace a lot of sort of what I now write about bureaucracy and process and, and, and government um, to you. And, but the, the question I have um, with this latest book is that, to me, it seems like a lot of this didn't actually originate politically, right? It actually originated in law schools that changed how we thought about what common law was, that changed the procedure of common law to expand what courts had oversight over, to expand what they could do with that oversight. Um, and I think it is absolutely infecting our politics, and it is infecting our bureaucracy, and it is making things worse. This this focus on proceduralism is making things worse on, on multiple levels, but manufacturers want that oversight in order to forestall lawsuits. Bureaucrats want these procedures in order to forestall lawsuits or firings or so forth. That, As uh, Nicole right. Galinas pointed out, that there are a lot of interests at stake, right, that we've created the system with all these overlapping interests. How do we reverse a problem that I think in many ways originated in the academy and how we thought about what law and rules and bureaucracy were for 
Um, you know, we can't just vote to undo how courts see their job. They're actually, they're the right. anti-democratic in institution. Well, it's a really hard problem, and one of the reasons we're having this forum is to begin a public um, debate and discussion about the need to, to fix this. To so go to your liability point, the reasons people fear liability is in part because judges refuse to draw lines based on what they believe to be the values of reasonableness in society. So when some crazy person sues his dry cleaners for $54 million because they lost a pair of pants, this is a real case, the court doesn't throw it out. The court has to go through a full trial and appeal and it takes years. It's completely absurd. It could have been disposed of in 10 seconds. Uh, um, maybe you have a claim for $50 for a lost pair of pants uh, in small claims court, case dismissed without prejudice to going to small claims court. It requires a judge simply saying that and going like that. But that requires the judge to use his values about what's a reasonable lawsuit or not, and judges no longer have that idea. So there is a kind of a legal cultural pivot uh, required. I don't think the academy is going to change until the, there's a groundswell of uh, opinion and anger directed at them from the public, the same way they didn't change in the 1960s until people were on the streets. So. Um you know, I'm not an economist and I'm not a sociologist, so I feel like the one area of expertise that I have to offer here is sort of in the area of, 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 <laughs> of communications. And as I've been listening to the discussion today, you know, it seems to me that on, there's obviously a spectrum, but on both sides of this issue, I think there's a, a, a failure of communication, right? So if you agree with Sally that in fact a bureaucracy is better than it gets, you know, credit for, it is part of the job of the people, not the bureaucrats and the politicians uh, and, um, you know, who, who, who uh, oversee them to communicate that effectively. I mean, I would argue, this is just my own observation, that, that the Obama administration, even if you think the Obama administration did some good things, they were very bad at actually communicating to people what they actually had accomplished. So I think that's... So, so if you want to defend a role of bureaucracy, I think you, you have to do that um, uh, as, part, as part of the, uh, of the job. On the other area, and this is the question I would raise for you, is um, I think that to, there's also the danger of making it sound too simple. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of the things we're suffering from right now under the current administration, right? So, so Trump kind of said, you know, no problem, you know, I can fix it. This is going to be easy. Um, and it turns out that it's not so easy and you can, you know, argue about, you know, his particular uh, effectiveness or lack thereof, but it wouldn't be easy for anybody. I think it's a bit, you know, misleading. Uh, and so if you make it sound like it's easy, and then you can't deliver on that, it seems to me you just reinforce the cynicism. So part of the job here, it seems to me, is to be really honest about what it would take and figure out a way in this very, you know, kind of ADD, I mean, that's, well, I'm glad that Professor Homer was here to talk about the psychology of this thing, culture, where you can communicate the, the, the complexity of it and how hard it is going to be to actually fix but still make it easy enough and appealing enough for people to go along with the ride and actually allow, give you some room to try to do it. So. Uh, I, 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 will, uh, I will ask another question, which is related, which is how... I mean, that was probably a question, right, too. I mean, yeah. I'm not just an observation about what, what you... I mean, I, I, think I, th I think part of the, the question that I always have about this is like, in some ways, right, the, to go back to the original question that I asked, right, this is something that you can communicate in groups like this, right? Your book is, is not like, it's not an abstract uh, f philosophical work written in German, but it is, it is a, a fairly complicated idea of how government should work, right? It is a fairly complicated and subtle and nuanced, as we like to say in the journalism biz, um, treatment of a hard problem, right? Because I don't think that you're promising, oh, well, we'll just do these four, the one simple thing that will totally revolutionize your government, right? You recognize that it's a very, 
it's going to be a long slog and you're going to be like feeling your way and working with interest groups. Um, and that kind of slog, you can, that's, that's a discussion you can have with a bunch of professors, effete, you know, elites sitting in, in cities. It's not a discussion you can have at a campaign rally. Right, so how do you, like, the weird thing is I can much more easily picture reversing this in the academy, not easily, but more easily than I can of anyone campaigning on, like, there's this incredibly complicated problem that's making you hate the government and I can fix it, but I need... <laughs> I need five hours of your time to get started, and then we'll have, you know. Well, I mainly need you to buy my book. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, always, always uh, buy the, uh, yeah, Exactly. Give uh, them as gifts. They're yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what's happening. The, um, <laughs> um, you know, I come from um, a simple background, and so I think it probably is hard in a campaign rally, and it is the point of experts on leadership that leaders uh, never uh, lead with ideas. They always pick up on other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. There are other movements for other ideas. So, so Doris Kearns Goodman's on the stump right now making this point. The idea has to get going, and then, it, then some leaders hit, put, put their hook on the idea and try to, try to make it go forward. And one of the purposes of this forum is to get people you know, thinking this way. However, while there are many uh, I think subtleties around what we're talking about, I mean, one we haven't talked about here today, is uh, the virtue of uncertainty in legal structures. It's an incredibly important point. People need to have a little bit of risk mm -hmm. in order to be reasonable in, when, they, when they're in a negotiating setting. So we have a whole discussion about the role of uncertainty and the need for authority structures in the distance, not dictating, but as a sort of backstop. There are all sorts of important and, and somewhat subtle points um, that we could have, you know, a drink over, but uh, it's too early in the day. But there, are, but there are a couple of points I think are really simple, which is that we've tried to design a system that's better than people, and not only does it not work, and not only does it not alienate people, but it's getting, the, not, not alienate people, uh, it's getting worse every year because every ambiguity breeds more new rules and more processes and more anger and more rights and more sense of entitlement and stuff. And so, so we have a, that's a simple idea. People can disagree with it, but that's a simple idea. We've tried to create a system better than people. It is not working. The solution, in my view, is also simple, which is not that people can do anything they want, is that you, re you re-inject human, I use the word responsibility, which implies a measure of autonomy, but not, quote, discretion. You reintroduce human responsibility in these decisions at every level because people need to be able at every level to make those judgments. Those are two simple, I think, two simple ideas. The implementation of it's hard. Um, I've been talking to some law professors about creating a, drafting a federal statute which would allow waivers, broad waivers for localities to do things in a different way so that we could actually experiment with different ways of looking at how you, uh, um, giving schools more the autonomy that the, the charter schools have. You know, having worker safety uh, regulations in a certain area focus on concept. safety rather than so the proof of concept. Yeah, sort proof of, yeah, of, yeah. You know, get a proof of concept thing going, and but even getting that waiver, we try to get pilot projects for special health courts to eliminate the medical malpractice problem, which is really a terrible problem in, in medical management. Obama supported it. We had the it was being pushed by lobbyists from both sides on our behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in the proposed bill, and at the last night before the vote, Harry Reid, the Democratic majority leader, had it taken out and replaced at the, at the request of the trial lawyers hmm. and replaced by a provision that made it illegal to do a pilot project. Hmm. So, so even, even, doing, even doing proof of concept hmm. pilot projects will require a movement to get it going. So I have a question for both of you um, since you've both thought about this um, more um, 
than I have, which is the one thing that we do have today that we have not had, you know, uh, previously in history, are these sort of decentralized ways of communicating with each other through social media, text, technology, and so forth. Can that be harnessed to do some of the things we've been talking about today? And, in, and if so, in what way? Uh, well, uh, I, <laughs> well, I also actually spent a lot of time writing about uh, the ways in which this is breaking our politics. And so, I mean, one of the really interesting regularities, I do not claim that I can prove correlation. I merely throw out the, uh, the, uh, um, the observation that the major political upheavals of the 20th century basically follow by about 10 years the introduction of a revolutionary new communications technology. You get radio in the 20s as a mass phenomenon, and in the 30s and in the 20s in Italy, you get fascism. Uh, we get television in the 50s, disperses extremely fast, and in the 60s, you get revolutions all over the industrialized world. I don't know if these things are actually connected, but it is interesting, and we got uh, social media and the internet becoming a widespread phenomenon in the aughts, and the, the, uh, this decade, has the teens have been a very interesting decade politically everywhere. Um, and so, you know, I think right now, it's making it harder. Right, right now we can't, it's, it's very hard in Washington. I don't say we can't have discussions, we are having one now, but in Washington, it is very hard to have a discussion about anything except orange man bad, liberals bad, everyone bad, I hate them, I want them to die. Like, you know, it's, it's the most toxic I have ever seen politics in my lifetime. And while I'm only in my 40s, I talk to people in their 60s and 70s and they're like, well, in the 70s, People were crazier, but the politicians were sane. Now the politicians are crazy, and the people <laughs> seem like maybe they're okay. So, you know, I, I think that really right now what social media is is a mass system for hating each other and finding reasons to get angry. You know, you're going to, Mark asked me earlier, he made the comment, he said, you need a name, you need a, a handle. You know, what are we, what, what is it that we're talking about here? What is it that we're reaching for? And the answer is, uh, it, we don't really have a name, but it's, it's not it, it entirely implausible to me that people who are searching for an island of sanity in the vituperative you know, social media world, um, uh, it's not implausible that they might actually come mm -hmm. to a place where, where the discussion was realistic and sane and strive toward, you know, recognize the complexity of the problem and, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, but, but talked about the kind of human needs that have driven the, the, the politics. It, by the way, it's worth commenting that a polarized Washington is incredibly good for business in Washington. The oh, yes. parties oh, yes. are making out like bandits. Mm -hmm. The people who hate Trump are filling in the coffers of the Democrats. The people who like Trump are don't like Elizabeth Warren or filling up the other coffers. So it's not easy to imagine, I and mean, it's not hard to imagine a, uh, inventing a sane island that, that's principled, but with a name, mm -hmm. we, but we don't have the name and we need to sort of create the island. But it's, I don't, I don't really know anybody except for some think tanks who talk in think tank language, so they don't really talk to real people. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who's doing that. Do you? Uh, no, and I think it's, I mean, the, the sort of really interesting thing to me about the current political environment and watching how journalism works is that people are, right now, what sells is anger, what sells is rage. I can mm -hmm. see it in yeah. what, which of my articles get clicked on. And I was talking to a friend who's a drug policy researcher, and he said that, like, Twitter is starting to remind him of uh, people with methamphetamine addictions in that they're just constantly seeking, people go onto social media, they go into the media to find reasons to get angry because that suppresses all their other negative emotionality, right? When you're angry, you're not anxious or sad or worried, you're just angry. Um, and so I think that we need like, but I think people are tired of it and I would certainly like to believe that, that people will eventually figure out, as they did with methamphetamines after they were invented, that this is not a good way to live and, and turn around and seek something healthier. Okay. Yeah, shall we take questions from the audience? Oh, there's a mic here. This is a, the host of a great podcast series called, called How Do We Fix It? Oh, thank you. So, so are you going to fix it? No, just mm -hmm. keep, keep talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you in terms of solutions, which is my dogmatic focus. Um, localism. There's been all this talk about Washington's being broken and national trends in the Obama administration and Trump. And I just wondered whether you could address whether some of the answers will come not from the federal government that we arguably already ask way too much of, but from cities and states. And, uh, Are you asking me? Yeah, I, I'm okay, asking you to, to, uh, say, to, to uh, whether, whether localism is part of the answer. Uh, first of all, localism is clearly part of the answer, in part because people need the dignity and respect of making choices. Otherwise, they're going to vote for Donald Trump. You know, people do not like, for some reason, Big Brother telling them what they can say or not say in the workplace and how to run their schools. The, um, the advantage of a goals-based, principles-based system of government is it leaves implementation down at the local level. So the people in eastern Kentucky where I grew up can do it completely differently as they will than the people in, say, Santa Barbara. <laughs> you know, I mean, they have different values. Different, and, and the other advantage of, of goals-oriented, unlike the idea of federalism, which is let the states do whatever they want, is you still have the measure of oversight. So you have that kind of uncertainty that if you go nuts and you start teaching creationism as the way of the world or something, that, that somebody will say, no, that's going too far. Mm -hmm. Or if you're really doing a lousy job. So you can still be accountable. But the advantage of a, of a more general system particularly when we're talking about, and there are all sorts of different situations, and I've written about this before, but you know, environmental protection is different than running a school, is different than a, than a caring nursing home. They're all different, they all require different systems, but particularly for safety and oversight and quality, localism is really important. Uh, other questions from the audience? Um, Yes, right there. Yeah, Thank Philip, you. do you see the, uh, I can do it without a microphone. It's for the, uh, it's for the camera. Oh, sorry. Um, do you think the Republicans or the Democrats can add to this debate, or do you think it requires an entirely separate audience to be leading this charge? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I don't really know that much about politics. My impression is that, is that both parties are absolutely horrible, and they're uh, in, in part because of of, of you know gerrymandering and other things, but you, you get extremists. You get the, the incentives are toward extremism, and you see that in the in the new in the new Democratic candidates coming up for president. Um, uh, I don't know if, if you can start a new party or not. They say you can't, but then, but Donald Trump in effect took over a party. Donald mm -hmm. Trump was not a party. He was a you know, it's a, he's a feral genius, right? He's, he's very good at finding people's weak points and going for their throats. And then he, that, he used that effectively to blow away 14, you know, nominees for the Republican nomination. But the, um, but it's clear to me, given where we are, that we're going to have to create a new narrative and a movement for one or the other party to move toward the center. And it's, in my hope would be the radical center, that is to say, not just let's compromise, but let's, let's remake how we do things. But, um, but I don't think anything's going to happen good politically through the natural uh, momentum of the current party debates. It will only happen if we or others start something new and a new narrative that, that makes people think about things in a certain way and will attract or potentially attract a body of voters, you know, towards towards that person. And then you'd get maybe both parties moving toward the center again, which would be a good thing. Have you sent your book to Oprah? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you could. I would give you a book. The, uh, I was once on Oprah. Uh, I was debating the McDonald's hot coffee judge. And um, <laughs> it was back and forth. And walking out, he said, you know, your theories are fine, but who am I to judge? <laughs> that was a great Very question. good question. Um, what is truth, said Pontius Pilate, and washed his hands. Um, other questions from the audience? Okay, no other questions. Oh, oh, wait, Nicole. Nicole. Thank you. 
Yep. Richard just asked about whether localism can make a difference, and I want to expand upon that and give one local example. Right now, we have all of these problems with the MTA, and I never know quite how to think about it, because on the one hand, Governor Cuomo is saying it's almost a Trumpian, you know, I alone can fix it, that he wants to take accountability for what happens with the subway and bus system, which is good, because no one else has wanted to take accountability before. But on the other hand, his answer is to create a new panel of appointed experts to oversee the MTA board. So instead of fixing the existing bureaucracy, he wants to add a new layer of bureaucracy. And I'm just wondering, is this a valid approach? I mean, some people argue you can't fix these bureaucracies. You just have to ignore them. But that doesn't seem like a very good solution, because we're just going to be creating more bureaucracies that we're going to have to ignore. Well, that's where Paul Leith, been standing in the back still, has written a lot about this. There is this tendency when things aren't working the way you want, to, want them to work, is you add a new layer. You say, this layer will now be in charge. And so he, he just seems to be falling into that same rut, except it's a layer of commissions instead of a layer of, you know, deputy associate uh, assistant attorney generals or whatever. Um, so, um, you know, ultimately, I think clarity of authority uh, in a democracy is really important so people know who's making decisions, who should be accountable. And um, I think Cuomo's instinct is probably right that it's a tangle. Um, if you really wanted to fix it, you would actually first say this will preempt all these other systems and we're creating a new authority. Um, Paul Romer didn't get to this, but one of what Paul Romer has written about is that when you have broken legacy, or let's write right, broken, when you have legacy institutions, legacy bureaucracies, they develop their own culture as well as structure, and it's very hard to go in and fix them. You actually need to start a new one. And so when Dayton Hudson apartment store chain wanted to create something that would compete with the big box stores, they didn't open a new branch of Dayton Hudson. They actually went, some, bought, hired entirely new people in an entirely different place and said, create Target. But I think what we've seen, at least I think, you know, under, you know, both parties uh, in Washington for a long time now is, uh, presidential candidates who run against Washington, they arrive in Washington, and rather than actually deal with the bureaucracy that's there, they try to run the entire government out of the West Wing, right. often with yeah, essentially, completely. essentially completely. With, with, with political people. Right. But, you know, and, and usually they don't succeed all that well, but meanwhile, by the time they leave town, the permanent bureaucracy is still there, and that's where I think government is different than business, because right. even if you're successful, you know, if you come along and you create a completely new business and, it, and, and you're really good at it, the old business dies. It goes away. Right. But bureaucracy never goes away in Washington. So to some degree, it seems to me, to fix this on the federal level, you still need um, uh, elected officials who are willing to not try to just circumvent the bureaucracy, but take it but on, take it on right. head on. So, so Nicole has hit on the intersection of, uh, of several of my personal interests, because in, these, in the supreme irony of my life as a libertarian columnist, I'm the child of a lobbyist, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically a lobbyist for New York City's infrastructure industry, now retired. Um, and so I have lots of opinions on the New York City subway, but also on failing companies and failing bureaucracies. Um, and so I would say a couple things. And the first is that, yes, it is a unique problem to government, not because these problems don't show up in companies. They absolutely do. My favorite example of this was uh, I did temp work at a company that was, I would imagine, having some cost problems. So they had decided, like, everyone gets one pen, right? Because we're going to cut down on all of the rampant pen thefts. So you have to bring back your old depleted pen to get a new pen. Well, as you can imagine, what then happened was that someone lost their pen. And then the next thing they did was steal someone else's pen. And soon the entire office was occupied in basically nothing but either stealing pens or like defending their pens from other pen thieves. <laughs> so this is a completely counterproductive way to deal with it. But like, it, it, right, I assume that company is no longer with us. But if that were a 
government agency, we would be in like year 25 of uh, the Great Pen Roundtable, right? right? And so that's part of it. But but there there is a thing about federalism, and I think something that Cuomo is dealing with, and something that we deal with. And and I just wrote about this actually recently with regards to um, California's high speed rail. One of the things that really afflicts federalism in the United States is like that it's overlapping, right? It's not a central authority that is down. It is then devolving some authority to a, a another group, with still, as Philip says, a a line of accountability to the top, where presumably, like Eisenhower, the buck stops here with the president, right? Instead, what you actually have is competing governments. And no one has any authority to resolve anything. And so you see this anywhere, basically, where the transit system crosses state lines. You see it in Washington, where we have a completely, discom totally dysfunctional uh, try, it basically, DC, Virginia, Maryland. No one has final authority except Congress, who doesn't care. They can't fund anything. And you know, as my husband recently said when we were talking about subway lines, they were like, you know, you can ride that line more days than not, and it will not catch fire. Um, I know you guys have similar problems here since I grew up here. Um, but you know, the, what Cuomo is trying to solve is that very small governments are subject to capture by special interests. Very large governments are much less subject to that, but then have this problem of like managing a very large institution is very difficult. America manages to neatly combine those two problems in one system, and so what you end up with is our, our 2.5 billion a mile uh, tunneling costs and all the rest of it, because we combine all of that lobbying power of very small groups with the proceduralism of the feds. So my dad used to estimate that adding federal money to a project would add about five years to completion, because the compliance then sucks up more time, and you need more consultants to do the compliance and all of this. And so, you know, I don't know how to fix that problem. It is somewhat weirdly unique to the American system because we don't merely have, like, devolved power. We actually have literally, the federal government just can't say no to a bunch of stuff. Um, and the fact is that, like, most of the cities on the coasts have been very well captured by their special interests and will lobby to keep the 25 guys sitting in the tunnel doing nothing. Yeah, um, yes, is the solution then to go back to privatization with contracts that are supervised, um, super, uh, contracts that are supervised by the longer term contracts that are supervised by the the federal le the local level or whatever. We note that um, the Canadians have privatized their air traffic system, and in fact, all of these municipal rail systems a hundred years ago they were private and integrated. So you you had the Pennsylvania Railroad or New York Central or the traction monopolies or whatever, and so somebody was at least minding the whole store and taking risk. Because the other thing is, uh, since it was a private business, and if they screwed up, they, it would fail. The problem is when all these entities failed in the 60s, then rather than reorganizing them on a private basis, we pushed them back into permanent bureaucracies. Um, well, privatization opens up a, um, uh, you know, a sort of a, a different political debate, uh, but you, you know, in most of the inefficient contracts we're talking about are contracts given to private entities to build a tunnel and such, but they're given with so many specifications and so many constraints that there's actually not an incentive um, to be to be innovative. Um, uh, so I don't think privatization is a silver bullet, but I think the human choice uh, and accomplishment pressures of privatization are really important. Sometimes you could do it by privatizing, but other times you, you would need to put those dynamics into the decision making for the school or wherever it is, where people do feel free to innovate. They do feel free to try to, they wake up in the morning thinking they can make things better. And instead we have a system of government where people wake up in the morning and they sort of comply. And, and that's a very different, world in the world that you're imagining, and it's, that's the one that we're talking about today and the need to fix. Um, I well, I think that's a stirring that's way to end this right. panel. Thank you all yeah, so much for coming. coming. Thank you so much.